mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've ever had a bad boss, you know how hard it is to follow uh, them as a leader. I uh, worked for Walgreens for one year. Uh, it was right after college. Uh, Hannah and I left uh, um, Nebraska to go on her internship in Michigan. So we were in Flint, Michigan for a year, or just outside of it. And we, I worked at a store downtown Flint uh, for Walgreens. I was there for a year. And we knew we would only be there for a year because we were going to go to seminary right afterwards. And so I, I hung it out. But it was, it was one of the diff, most difficult jobs I had because the boss was a, was a bad leader. She led with fear, with anger. She was a, a dictator in, in the most sense of the word. And, you know, sometimes that can be an appropriate leadership tool, but not without any sort of love or compassion involved. And she led with fear. She was the kind of person when you walked in, if you weren't working the minute you got there, uh, you heard about it. You heard about it loudly. And there was never a thank you or a great job or, or keep up the good work, anything like that. No encouraging words, but just the anger and the fear. Well, this with the morale of the staff, it kept it pretty low. To the point where a lot of people quit over my time there. I worked there for one year and I saw 15 people come in and go out uh, before I left. You see, the fear that she led with led to anger among the employees, depression among some, and a, and a general unwillingness to be a good steward of your time, or the talent that you had, or the resources that you had been entrusted with as a steward among uh, these employees. Basically, what would happen is people would come to work and They'd be told what to do, and they would try to make it last as long as possible, because if they were caught not doing something, they knew they would get in trouble. And so nobody wanted to be a good steward. Well, that's one type of a bad boss, the, the one who motivates based on fear and anger. But you can go to the other extreme, a bad boss who motivates simply based on wanting to be your friend. And if you've ever seen an episode of the, the show The Office, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Michael Scott is the manager of a, of a regional paper company, and he's got an office that he works for. But he wants to be everybody's best friend, and he's more uh, motivated by being loved than he is by his bottom line. And so he doesn't hold anybody accountable. He has no credibility as a boss. He just wants to be liked. And so as he leads his people, nobody wants to be a good steward of their time, their talent and what they do, or the resources they've been entrusted with. The only people who seem to do any sort of work in that office are the salesmen who are only motivated by their patients, right? There's even an episode of The Office, there's a few episodes where they absorb another branch, and, and because of his leadership style and just wanting to be a friend, uh, the, first, the first day uh, people aren't really understanding his tactics, so one quits, and by the end of three episodes, everyone from that office has quit, because they can't work with him, because he's not encouraging them. He doesn't help them to improve, and he doesn't hold them accountable. Either way, it doesn't matter the leadership style, when you have a bad leader, there's no accountability, there's no credibility, and there's no reason to, uh, to be a good steward of your time, your talent, or your treasure. Well, praise be to God that Jesus is our leader and that He is a good leader. He's a law and gospel leader. Even though He desires to be loved and even though He leads with compassion and love, He still is unwilling to expose to us our sins. Matter of fact, His Word, uh, the Scriptures are filled with verses that show us our sins. He, when He lived on this earth and He walked among Judea and He walked among Jerusalem, He would walk and He would find people and He would talk with them. And He would expose to them their sinfulness, but He didn't just do it in a mean and hateful, fearful way. But He did it with love and compassion. As He walked through Judea, He found a woman at a well and He said to her, 
You're an adulterer. But I have a better life for you. Follow me and I will give you a better life. To the tax collectors that you hung out with, you guys are thieves and liars, but I have a better life for you. Come with me and I will lead you to a better life. And even to the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were so unwilling to see him as the Messiah, he offered them a better life. You see, he pointed out people's sins and their unrighteousness, but he also led them with compassion to paths of righteousness, a true law and gospel leader. See, he's the kind of leader that even though he knows that we are sinful, he is willing to die for us, and he did die for us. He shed his blood on that cross so that you and I could be forgiven. His blood flowed freely as an atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice that forgives all of our sins so that you and I could be in heaven with him someday, so that we would experience life everlasting. His death on that cross leads us down paths of righteousness. As we talk about Jesus' leadership today, we're going to use Psalm 23 as our text. <coughs> uh, psalm 23 is uh, a well-known psalm. Uh, it's the one that we said earlier in, in the service and we said responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd, and he is a shepherd who leads his people. I'm fairly convinced, uh, fairly certain, I, yeah, I'm fairly convinced and certain that when Jesus said the words in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd, he had this psalm in mind. Listen to these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You see, with Jesus there is no desire, there is no lack of spirit of, of needs. He has provided for us everything we need to support this body and life. The Lord is our shepherd, and he leads us just like that oster of the shepherd, leading those sheep to, to good pasture where there's plenty of food, where he's leading them to water, he's leading them uh, maybe even to China. <laughs> Jesus is our shepherd, and because of him we have nothing to lack. As we pray every Sunday, we pray the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, we pray the words, Give us this day our daily bread. And we ask, what does this mean? And we say it means that God gives us everything we need to support this body of life. That daily bread is given to us in food, in water, in shelter, in clothing. Luther gone to say in land, in animals, in children, husband and wife. Everything we need to support this body of life. Our education, our resources, everything comes from God. And in this text, Jesus, who describes us as sheep, says he makes us lie down in green pastures. Jesus, the good shepherd, leads us to green pastures. Imagine that for a moment, that there's a field of green, and you're a sheep, and there's a sheep just kind of nibbling on the grass. It's so much grass, he can eat for weeks. And imagine a meadow. One of the kids this morning at the other service said, uh, a shepherd would lead you to a meadow. Imagine a meadow filled with fragrant flowers and soft grass, somewhere where you could just lie down and take a nap. This green pasture is a place not only for food, but also for rest and refreshment. And then he says, the psalmist says, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. You know, I've heard it said once before that because of the shape of a, a sheep's face, they can't actually drink from anything that's running too fast. They have to have a still, calm stream or a pond. Uh, because of the shape of their face, if, they, if the water splashes up, it'll get into their nostrils and they'll actually uh, could drown from that. So the shepherd has to be careful where he takes them and he finds the, the calmest part of the stream. And he gives them a place where they can drink and be refreshed and their soul can be restored. And as I was thinking about that today, I was thinking, you know, have you ever been out on a hot day? And it's, it's just scorching day. Maybe you're doing some yard work or just out for a walk. And, and the first thing you do is you come inside and the air conditioner hits you and you're like, oh, that feels good. 
And then the next thing you do is you get an ice cold glass of water and you start drinking it. And you can feel it, the cold, going all the way down your throat and filling your stomach and, and, and lining your esophagus. And it feels good. And it feels refreshing. To the point where you don't want to stop drinking. You just want to keep going because it's, it's cool and it restores your soul. This is the kind of the water that God is talking about. He gives us daily water that restores our soul. That is like that, that fresh, cold drink of ice water on a hot summer day. Or here on a hot winter's day, I guess, right? It restores our soul. And then he says, he leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jesus, as our leader, takes us to the green pasture to be fed, to the water to be refreshed, and then he leads us on paths of righteousness. Not because I deserve it, not because of anything I've done, but for his own name's sake, because he is our God, and he has chosen you and me as his people. He has chosen us to be his redeemed. So he leads us then on paths of righteousness, where we are forgiven. He leads us on paths of righteousness, where we are restored for His own name's sake. This is greater than any, any kind of leader I could ever even think of. Someone who would lead us on paths of righteousness just because of the, who they are as a person. And that is who Jesus is. And in our text today, in, in our Gospel reading, He says, He is the Good Shepherd who even lays down His life for His friends. And that's what He does. Leading us on paths of righteousness, he sacrificed himself so that we could be forgiven. He, he died on that cross and rose from the dead so that we could have eternal life in his name and live on those paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, all these things in this first, I don't know what you want to call it, first half of the, of the psalm. All of these things show how great and wonderful a leader Jesus is. He is truly a loving and compassionate leader. But at the same time, he is not afraid to tell us when we're wrong. In order to lead a sheep, there are times when you have to pull it back onto the path. That's why the, the, the staff has that crook. You pull it back onto the path. He is not afraid to lay down his life for his sheep either. Well, as we finish kind of wrapping up that first half of this uh, text, we, we look at God's provision in that, that He has given us everything we need to support this body of life, and that Jesus is a good leader. And now we get to verse 4 of the psalm. And verse four, 4 of the psalm is the only verse in the psalm that talks about you and I now. The focus is no longer on Jesus. Jesus has been the subject of the psalm since uh, up until now, and it will be right after this. Now it switches to you and I, but listen to the words. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. The first thing the psalmist has to say about you and I is that we live in a sinful world. We live in a valley of the shadow of death. We live in a place where sin, the death, and the power of the devil run rampant in our lives. We live in a place where the world is a challenging world. And it pulls us away from trusting in God and His provision at just nearly every step of the day. The world says that you and I should, should leave God behind and, and, and not be good stewards of what He's given us and just use His, His provision to accumulate more wealth and more possessions. The world says we should focus on ourselves rather than one another in Christ. The world says that we shouldn't trust in his leadership. The truth is that we are taken in by the world's lure as well. And we fail to be the good stewards of God's provision that he has entrusted to us through his leadership. God true, certainly has provided everything we need for this body and life. He certainly does bless us with food, home, and shelter. He gives us car rides when we need them. He gives us clothing when we need it. He gives us everything. And yet we typically turn and seek to gain more possessions or money. We typically try to utilize our time and talents for our own benefit instead of for the benefit of God's kingdom. 
You know, as we are uh, in the grasp and the lure of the world, often the world invites us to ask, and we ask along with the world, does God really care if I give a 10% tithe to, the, to His church, to His kingdom? Does God really care if I donate my time to His church? Does God really care if I give my talent for the benefit of His kingdom? Does God really care? You know, we ask these questions because we do want to keep His provision for ourselves. We do not like sharing. We keep these provisions for ourselves because we know that God isn't the hostile leader who motivates through fear. We try to keep these provisions for ourselves because we uh, are too greedy with God's generosity. But the truth is this, that God does care. He cares a lot and He loves you. God loves you and He cares if you tithe. God loves you and He cares if you give of your talents. God loves you and He cares if you use uh, your, your, uh, your time. God loves you and He cares. He cares so much that once again, I'll say it, He sent His only Son to be our good shepherd, to lay down His life for His sheep, to lead us on paths of righteousness, to provide for our every needs, and to be there when we need Him most. You see, as this psalm now begins to wrap up, we see that God has prepared a table before me in the presence of our enemies, and He anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. God cares so much that He has given us an abundance of what we need, that as we sit at that table on the righteous seat of God, our cup overflows with righteousness, our, overflow, our cup overflows with what we need to live. And He has this promise at the end of the psalm, that as our cup is overflowing, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. With Jesus as our leader, we know we will be in His house forever, and that mercy will follow us wherever we go. And where there is mercy, there is forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life everlasting. So with Christ as our leader, as He has given us every need to support this body and life, and given all we need in His death and resurrection for the life to come, we now go and we generously share of His gifts as good stewards for the growth of His kingdom. Amen. And now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Amen.